Okay, how do you pronounce your last name? Because I don't want to butcher it. Pasta. Pasta. Okay, cool. Good. Cool. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Vivian Pastel's talk on Practice Safe Cyber. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all so much for joining me for my very first really real conference talk. Uh, I'm Vivian Pastel, and this is Practice Safe Cyber, the Miseducation of American Students on Internet Safety. Uh, this talk is going to be lots of fun for all of us, I promise, uh, but it's going to get really fun during Q&A when I pop open my moral support flask. So <laughs> ready your questions. Uh, anyways, let's start talking about some educational travesties. All right, so I am here to speak to you from the other side of the InfoSec divide. I am not in the industry, although I am looking for a job, so considering crossing that divide. Uh, I am just a humble fan. This is my third besides Las Vegas and DEF CON, so I'm kind of noob, but the smell is wearing off. Um, I've been voiding warranties and breaking computers since I was about 12. And as of now, I am a former high school teacher from Oakland. Uh, graduate student and education researcher here to tell you about the horrors being perpetrated upon our impressionable youths. So, this talk is several things. First, what it isn't. This talk is not a hard code talk. Uh, there will be no samples, no keyboard pounding, no maximizing or minimizing or quickly moving around the screen of Windows. What this talk is, is a fresh new perspective on some of the challenges facing the infosec industry from the point of view of someone who isn't embedded in this shit all day. Uh, because I'm a teacher, there's some optional extra credit homework at the end. Uh, and because I'm me, there's a lot of cat gifts. So why care about the perspective of a high school teacher who is not in the industry? Well, have you felt stressed out lately? Users pissing you off, project managers, maybe even your organizational leadership. How's your blood pressure? How are your health insurance premiums? Have you tried to hire anyone? Has it driven you a little bit crazy? Uh, are you just surly and like complaining? I do. Uh, I am here for you. This is the talk for you. And also, this real housewife has clearly at some point tried to hire someone in the infosec industry. <laughs> So what this is, is students as citizens and the idea of the internet as a human right. Um, I'm not saying every kid needs to be a hacker. Sure, it would be great if we were spewing little leet hacksaws out of schools left and right, uh, but doing that isn't a requirement. We just need to meet the basic needs and rights of our students. Um, in today's society, internet is a basic need and should be seen as a human right. Thank you, EFF. Uh, 80% of middle school of middle skill level jobs, and that is jobs that require less than a bachelor's degree, uh, require tech skills. And at least 58% of millennials have low problem solving skills with technology, which, going back to my previous slide, you've probably noticed in the workplace. And 91% of millennials do not believe that they have problematic levels of tech competency. <laughs> You have probably also witnessed this. So what the hell are problematic levels? Uh, the Program for International Assessment of Adult Competencies uh, is a 2012 survey that measures tech skills from below level one through to level three. Uh, Jesus wall of text. Uh, level two is the minimum standard skill level to access uh, professional and social benefits of technology. Level one means someone is unable to solve a problem whose solution takes several steps and requires a small number of computer applications. So for example, uh, they might have difficulty finding information in a spreadsheet by sorting rows and columns, and then they would have a difficult time getting that information into an email to send it to the person who asked for it. Yeah. Uh, below level one would have difficulty sorting email responses into pre-existing folders. Yeah. And 19% uh, of millennials, I hate that I'm like mocking my own generation and it's like the hot thing to mock millennials, but whatever, this is a tragedy. Uh, so 19% of millennials score below level one. And 78% of those don't think that they're lacking in skills. 
58% of millennials score level one. So you've probably seen this again and experienced this frustration at work. In short, the big problem is that we have this misconception that using technology is the same as using it well. Uh, that just because like I've got my handy dandy little smartphone here and I can swipe right on Tinder, that, that means I know how to operate a computer. This is not true. Uh, so there is this idea, kids have smartphones these days. They know what they're doing. First off, it's a completely different skill set, um, and basic computer literacy classes are disappearing from schools because of this assumption, kids just know. In my 10th grade classroom, I had kids who had never used a QWERTY keyboard before in their lives. And it's not because they're teaching Dvorak. Um, <laughs> time spent interfacing with technology devices is not the same as problem solving with technology devices or understanding how to truly use these devices or the internet. And that's the root of the problem is that we have this idea that because kids are on Facebook all the time, they know what they're doing. This slide is a little bit of a tangent, uh, but I found this information to be incredibly valuable. Um, as students are having less and less exposure to technology in schools, it's being demonstrated over and over that early exposure to technology, computer science and problem solving and critical thinking using technology is essential to inspiring the next generation of the tech workforce. So that whole bit about the pipeline problem and how hard it is to hire competent people, Here's part of the root problem. Not only are students not being exposed to CS, they're often not even being exposed to basic skills like keyboarding and attaching a document to an email, uh, which means that if they do eventually, say, in college or later on in life, stumble on CS or InfoSec, they're grossly underprepared to engage with it. So what are our kids being taught? Not much. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, CS courses and enrollment have declined over the last decade. Meanwhile, hours of instruction in high schools have gone up. The class of 2009 received roughly 420 hours more of classroom instruction than the class of 1990. I don't know what they're doing with that time. Dance, basket weaving, I don't know. Uh, so a major part of the problem, however, is that teachers don't feel equipped to teach technology or to even use it in the classroom. Uh, surveyed, 62% of teachers self-identified as uncomfortable with technology and that that inhibited their use in the classroom. And having been in the trenches, I'm amazed the number is so low. Like 62%, that's actually uh, not bad. Uh, basically, none of my colleagues expected students to use computers and they themselves avoided it as much as they possibly could. So, since data-driven instruction is a current educational trend, here's some data-driven lack of instruction. Um, a chart, because numbers make everything serious. Uh, you can see that this is the percentage of high school students enrolled in computer science over the last roughly two decades, and although it's a drop of 6%, uh, that is a statistically significant difference. And more importantly, every other STEM field was having significant increases in enrollment. So things like calculus are just like shooting up. Physics, shooting up. Chemistry, shooting up. But CS is going down. Um, so, 42,000 or more high schools in the United States. Uh, in 2011, only 2,100 of them were qualified to offer the AP Computer Science exam. And out of that, 3,101 students took it. That's like the size of the high school I taught at. That's nothing. Uh, Compare that with the numbers for students taking AP Government, AP US History, and AP English Literature. And do not give me that crap about CS being so much harder than humanities. Like yes, CS is hard, but so is calculus, and that went up, so did physics, and I think we can all agree that the AP CS exam really isn't that hard. So there's a serious issue with what's being offered and the quality of the instruction for us to be getting such low numbers and for, in fact, it to be declining. Charts don't lie. Look at those numbers. Look at them going up. Except CS. 
so sad. What the hell, CS? All right, so I figured, obviously classes aren't being offered. What are our kids being exposed to? So I decided to take a look at acceptable use policies. Uh, for many students, the AUP might be the only instruction that they ever receive about using technology safely and appropriately. Uh, so I decided to take a look. I surveyed the AUPs of district or, districts around Silicon Valley, where I'm based, because I figured that if we can't get it right, here, then uh, we're definitely fucked everywhere. Uh, Bay Area districts that I surveyed were San Francisco, Redwood City, San Jose, Mountain View, San Mateo, Santa Clara, Palo Alto, Oakland, Berkeley, uh, as well as I picked up a couple AUPs from around the country via my mentor. Uh, so we have Clark County here in Nevada, Cincinnati, Ohio, and Central Kitsap in Washington. So, <laughs> abandon all hope. Ye who log on here. The short version, AUPs are fucked. Every single AUP included a statement that students have zero expectation to privacy. Documents and email accounts can be searched and surveyed without notice and without cause. Those are my two favorite parts of it. Yeah, no notice, no cause. Um, and the issue with this is that students must agree to these terms in order to use technology in school, uh, which is often mandated, especially this is particularly important for students who don't have access to technology at home, because this may be their only opportunity to work with a computer. Um, these AUPs are essentially founded on the idea that students will willingly surrender their rights. That is my thought on this. <laughs> so here are some of my favorite quotes from the AUPs I read through. I read these so you guys don't have to. Uh, I hope you really appreciate my sacrifice. Users shall not promote the use of alcohol or tobacco. Harmful matter includes matter taken as a whole, which the average person, applying contemporary statewide standards, appeals to the prurient interest and is matter which depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct and which lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value for minors. If any of you know what the fuck that means, please. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, users shall not engage in damaging, degrading, or wasting any tech resource. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, don't even get me started on schools still on Windows XP. <sighs> It's a situation, people. Okay, come on, come on, buddy, go. All right, a personal favorite, material placed on student web pages are expected to meet academic standards of proper spelling and grammar. <sighs> Damn kids with their slang. All right, again, this cat sums up my emotions. Not enough face palms in the world. <laughs> All right, everything is forbidden, nothing is permitted. What I find really telling is that AUPs are structured around everything that students cannot do. So all of the items I'm about to put up there appeared in some form or another in every single AUP. File sharing, chatting and use of social media, sexting or sexual messaging, looking at inappropriate content, which we know just means boobs, uh, playing games, Palo Alto specifically bans World of Warcraft, which like I want to know the story of why they realized they had to do that, uh, posting anonymously, I shit you not, they ban posting anonymously, good luck, uh, sending chain letters or spamming, cyberbullying, okay, I can work with that, uh, and charging devices at school? They're like, you are expected to bring a device and use it all day, but you may not charge it. That's obviously a school bus. <laughs> no. 
So it's all about that basic control. What I learned from reading AUPs is exactly what I already know from being a teacher, which is we are far more focused on controlling student behavior than actually teaching them anything. Uh, most policies in place are based around the idea that all students are bad, pretty much. All of the AUPs focused on controlling behavior and codes of conduct, but nothing about preserving student safety or imparting skills. This is the closest thing that it comes to giving instruction around how to be safe online. Don't share personal information. Don't agree to meet anyone. And if you get a message that makes you uncomfortable, please tell a teacher or other staff member. Uh, so in short, the greatest threat to our students is their own naughtiness and other people's naughtiness. Sex is the greatest threat on the internet. Avoid pedo bear. <laughs> but he's always there. All right, so a little more of the horrifying. Um, if a student finds an inappropriate site or image, he or she must immediately minimize the program and contact the instructor. Because the first thing I'm going to do when I'm in high school and I find boobs is I'm going to tell my teacher. Uh, my assumption is that uh, this is so that students can be disciplined accordingly and that site can be added to the blacklist. I understand that student use of the technological resources is for educational purposes only. I understand that it is impossible for District Redacted to restrict access to all controversial materials. In other words, if my kid sees boobs at school, I can't sue you for it. And just let that sink in. You must not tell your logins or passwords to another person except to a teacher or other adult at school. Because adults on the internet are all pedo bear, but adults in the classroom are really just there to protect you by accessing your account. That's how it works. So things that are notably absent, because just as telling as what is present in an AUP is what isn't present. Not a single AUP includes a password policy other than you're responsible for having one. Nothing on how to create a strong password, no expectation of password changes, uh, not even a policy around default passwords having to be changed after initial login. And I'm not gonna tell you how long my email password was my staff ID number, because I just kept forgetting to change it. There's no expiration. Uh, nothing around things like two-factor authentication, metadata, malware, encryption, if concepts such as proxies, VMs, or encryption are addressed, it is always specifically to forbid them. So what this means, oh, I forgot that picture's there. I love that picture. Uh, what this means is that students are not learning anything other than that they need to cover their school's asses legally. All of these restrictions uh, are just to keep schools from being sued. So there's no explanation of what any of these things, such as proxies, VPNs, VMs, administrative access, there's no explanation of what any of it means, which means students are gonna end up doing it accidentally. It's gonna happen. Uh, and also this means that they don't know the ways in which these tools can help or protect them, and they will not have access to these skills to be able to utilize them in the future. And that's important. Um, instead, our students are trained to accept a lack of ownership over their lives, their data, and even their passwords. <coughs> Computer security is not about protecting yourself. It's about protecting your organization's legal ass. Thank you, Mr. Dubious Cat. So there are things that are going right. I don't want this to be all doom and gloom. Happy cat. So Roots Asylum will be happening at DEF CON in just a few days. Hack Kid Con has happened several times. Hacker High School and Code.org are two organizations I love uh, that they offer curriculum materials and trainings for teachers and school staff to help increase tech exposure and education in schools. Because again, if teachers don't feel confident instructing students around technology, they're not going to do it. But these programs provide them with the support to be able to do that. Because especially in Silicon Valley, if you can be a software engineer, you're not going to be teaching for 40K a year. So we have to teach the people that are in the classroom how to teach this. Uh, Cyber Patriot, regardless of your opinion of DOD-sponsored events, uh, brings age-appropriate and well-structured infosec training to middle and high school-aged students, uh, complete with curriculum materials. So same thing, teachers without a background can run a club. 
I did that. Uh, so I can vouch for their, their materials. Um, the major flaw with these models, however, oops, clicked ahead, sorry about that. Uh, the major flaw with these models is that a number of these really rely on, fuck it, uh, <laughs> really relies on uh, kids having someone who's pushing them into these programs and events or is providing support and guidance. How many kids do you think will be at Roots Asylum who don't have a parent at DEF CON? Yeah. Uh, so it's kind of the football parent syndrome in InfoSec where we've got all these great excited parents who are like, you're going to be a linebacker just like me. Hack all the things. And if you do not have a parent in InfoSec, you have no idea what the hell is going on. Uh, and you're not getting exposed. So, okay, come on. There we are. Okay, so if I've lit even the smallest of fire under your ass, Here's how you can get involved. Please fully give a fuck. Uh, so, this is your optional extra credit homework. Uh, email schools, districts, or politicians. This is a very small thing you can do, especially if you are great at writing scripts that send out daily emails going, God damn it, politician, why the fuck haven't you fixed computer science education yet? Don't even have to do much, just set up your little script. Um, tell them, like, go to schools and districts, tell them about programs like code.org, Hacker High School, Cyber Patriot, et cetera, because that way they don't have to spend money, which they hate, and you give them an answer. Uh, medium levels of involvement. Attend a PTA or a school board meeting and raise hell. You do not have to have a kid in a school in order to go to these things. You are a taxpayer. Yell at them to spend your money well. And finally, large. This is for the few, the proud, those who hate having a life. Uh, volunteer. Go help teachers. Offer to run a professional development session at a school. Uh, sponsor programs or clubs. Things like Cyber Patriot are always looking for industry professionals to work with these teachers uh, and help make them happen. Uh, also, Hoff has migrated east and Hack Kid is not happening this year, so get involved. Make it happen. Uh, so, your action items. Uh, we all really like to mock raising awareness, uh, but this is a place where it's really worthwhile because it is not your job, or even my job, to fix this problem. It is, however, our job to make those responsible so violently uncomfortable that they do something. Uh, the real issue here is that most people don't know shit. They don't know what's going on. Uh, and so if you let them know, they will react. Like, parents care, teachers care, um, but they don't know. So raising a ruckus can really go a long way. Talk, tweet, text, Facebook, whatever works for you. Uh, volunteering and getting involved is great, but as I said, that's for people who really hate free time. Uh, and as much as I would love if everyone did that, I get it. Uh, so please think about what I've said here today and the bleak future that we face. When you get home, start raising some hell. Why is my next slide something that has already happened? Fucking open office. All right, so you've seen this, you've seen this. There we are, that's where I'm trying to get to. Uh, before I switch over to questions, I want to thank everyone that made this happen, which is uh, the B-Side Selection Committee for giving me a chance. Erin Jacobs, AKA Sec Barbie, for her mentorship. Jesse Irwin for her awesome work on issues of security in EdTech and her promotion of the idea of EdSec. Uh, when she speaks, you should absolutely go to her talks. They are fantastic. Uh, Kevin Neely, my informal mentor, teacher, and driving force behind getting Cyber Patriot into Oakland schools. And Travis Carr, who unofficially sponsored this talk by buying me a lot of drinks and sitting in pubs with me while I made this slide deck. <laughs> so. It is now time for questions and drinks. This is my favorite part, so please ask good questions. Yes? So everything that trended up, is there a correlation with common core? Like, that seems to be where all the focus is these days versus the <laughs> So all the topics that trended up, would there be a correlation with common core? <laughs> 
Yeah. It's about Common Core. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the, uh, the things that trended up, it's not so much a correlation with Common Core. Uh, there is a little bit, but actually this is the first year that the science standards have been rolled out for Common Core, so that's sort of there, but what it really is is the frantic rush to look impressive for college applications, and so kids are cramming their schedule full of AP every single the fucking thing they can find, uh, whether or not they're prepared for it, and whether or not the teachers are prepared for it. Uh -oh. Yeah. Yes. So just a, a comment on my experience in mm -hmm. trying to volunteer to help my local school district. Uh, one of the challenges that I've run into is teachers are overworked and underpaid and they don't want to do things outside of my normal work day. Right? And I can yes. understand, mm -hmm. but it's just a challenge as somebody who wants to help out to be told, well, you have to do it from eight to five because that's more contractually obligated to be there. Well, yeah. I'm obligated to be in my job at that time. So. <laughs> yes, um, and that is absolutely like one of the major issues. Uh, some people have the flexibility to be able to go and do things during daytime hours. Some people don't, uh, and that's a really valid issue. And. As much as I hated working like 12 hour days, I wish more people would do it just because, yeah, like we're not going to be able to get people in outside of work hours very often. Um, that's where things like PTA meetings are worthwhile because then hopefully something happens and at least you can light a fire under their asses to get them to actually spend a little bit of money to hire someone to come in during working hours. Um, but yeah, very true. Yes, Phil. Uh, so one of the things you mentioned was that schools, AUP is, but I think schools in general are kind of built around the idea that children are bad and you must control them. Yes. Um, how much of the things that you're recommending are constantly battling against that and always going to have to battle against that? And how much of a long-term solution has to move into making schools not fundamentally about controlling bad children and actually about helping and teaching? Like, how, like, when do we move yeah. from if I could answer that, I probably wouldn't have quit teaching, <laughs> but <laughs> fuck that shit. Uh, so I think things like pushing for more actual instruction of even just basic computer literacy skills is one of the things that like I think a major root of this problem is the idea that technology is ubiquitous and therefore kids know what they're doing and don't need to be taught anything. And I think getting kids learning like how to use a freaking computer and not just a smartphone would be a really important first step because then you know that kids are eventually going to start exploring. So, yes sir. Yep. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here just because I'm curious to see how you approach it. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 years ago, they were teaching computer literacy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although the STEM education was adequate, it was under less political intrigue, and yet we had a burgeoning CS industry, a burgeoning security mm -hmm. industry grow out of that. We're the result, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the other help? What's the thing that's missing? that's not about teaching CS in the classroom. Because if we're, we're getting a push in STEM, which I think is mm -hmm. great, we need that, we need our kids to be able to problem solving and competency, are they, what are the other outcomes that we're missing in an outcome-based education that's mm -hmm. so good to come? So, first off, that's an awesome question. I'm gonna super quick paraphrase for people. Is basically 30 years ago, computer literacy skills weren't a thing, uh, but here you all are. Uh, so obviously, like, other than computer literacy, what's the problem? Um, and I think, like, that's a really good question. Um, and I think that part of it is that we're not really looking at and teaching critical thinking skills. Um, so like, that is, that's huge, is that kids sit down at computers when they do finally get exposed to them, and instead of having this adventurous sense of, I'm gonna see what happens if I push that, uh, it's like, well, I don't know how to do this. Miss P, Miss P, what do I do? Um, as opposed to, I'm going to figure this out for myself. Um, and I think also, 30 years ago, computers were so new, um, 
and the idea of like it, I think it was just a sort of a different atmosphere then. Um, there's still a little bit of this idea of computers are like a weird niche nerdy thing, but not in the same way, and that they are so omnipresent um, that I think there's no longer simply by sitting in front of a computer, you aren't necessarily going, this is so cool, I'm gonna try a bunch of things. You're like, I'm gonna check Facebook. Uh, and I think that's also the other big difference is that to interact with a computer is a very different experience. Yes? I don't think critical thinking changed though. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think people were taught back then that aren't taught now. I just mm -hmm. think there's more demand now. Like, there weren't as much demand for computer science 30 years ago. Yep. So there was enough supply for the weirdos who got into it. And now there's not enough of us weirdos. And that's why we see this. Yeah, I think the supply is mm -hmm. the same, just the demand is increasing. I think I agree with that, but also I'm just really jaded about how schools work. And I'm just pretty disappointed with them. So I'm going to. Schools work better 30 years ago? I don't know. No. <laughs> uh, so I am happy since it's lunchtime. I'm totally happy to stay here and answer more questions, but I'm getting flagged that the talk is technically over. So if anyone wants to ask more questions, I will totally answer them. Uh, but you're also free to go. 